Disrupting Japan, Episode 76. Disrupting Japan is sponsored by Wall and Case. If you've ever tried to hire staff in Japan, you know how crazy it can be. I mean, there are over 3,000 recruiting firms here, and they're all telling you pretty much the same thing. Well, the guys at Wall and Case are different. When you're coming into Japan, they'll sit down and work out a long term hiring strategy with you. Is it best to start with a country manager? or perhaps a head of partner sales. Maybe the first step is really a community manager. Now, I've known the team at Wall & Case for a long time, and they've worked with a lot of the companies that have been on this show and with some of the world's biggest brands as well. So if you're hiring in Japan, you really should talk to Wall & Case. Welcome to Disrupting Japan. Straight talk from the CEOs breaking into Japan. You know, I've always been a bit skeptical of co-working spaces, innovation centers, and startup community hubs. I mean, some of them are well-intended, but too often the organizations that put these facilities together have a bit of a field of dreams mindset, where if they just build the office space, the innovative entrepreneurs will come and the organizers will then find themselves at the center of a thriving startup ecosystem. Well, sometimes that actually happens, but usually not. But when it works, when all the pieces really do come together, amazing things happen, and a community develops that is far greater than the sum of its parts. So what's the real difference between the innovation spaces that flourish and those that stagnate? Well, today we get a chance to sit down and talk with Tim Rowe, CEO of the Cambridge Innovation Center, or CIC, the largest innovation center in the world. And we have a conversation about what's really involved in building an entrepreneurial community and the CIC's progress on building a very large-scale innovation center right here in Tokyo. It's a truly insightful conversation, so let's hear from our sponsors and get right to the interview. Your journey to success in Japan will involve some twists and turns, In trying to navigate new terrain, planning the safest, most effective way through on your own can be overwhelming. The Carter Group have been using market intelligence and research to guide Japan entrants for decades. They've honed an agile, cost-effective, but consultative approach that will help you find the perfect product market fit, explore user and consumer dynamics, and act as an honest broker to let you know the reputation and track record of potential partners here in Japan. And when you're ready to go, their executive search team can also help you hire the right people to drive your business forward. So if you haven't got Japan completely figured out yet, the Carter Group can help you out. If you're a startup thinking about Japan, you'll never really understand the opportunities here until you start to take a serious look at what's happening outside of Tokyo. Osaka in particular deserves your attention, and this is especially true if you and your team are involved in smart cities technologies. Now, Hankyu's GVH5 project is Osaka's startup central, and it's a great place for you to get started. They offer co-working space, bilingual business support, venture investment, and they're at the center of a great international startup and mentor community. Now, Hankyu's GVH5 in Osaka really deserves your attention. So pay him a visit at www.gvh-5.com slash en. You'll be glad you did. So I'm sitting here with Tim Rowe, CEO of the Cambridge Innovation Center. Now, this is a pretty incredible space that you've been running for 15 years now. So rather than have me explain it, can you tell us a bit about what CIC is and how it came to be? Sure. Uh, so CIC is the world's largest space for startups. Well, that is our Cambridge space specifically. We're also in Boston and Miami and St. Louis and Rotterdam, Netherlands at the moment, and we've got some more in the works. We are a, we call ourselves a community of startups. So we're not an accelerator where we're telling people how to build their business or investing in them. We've brought 15 venture capital funds into our location in Cambridge and some in our other locations. So there is access to money, but it's more of a sort of an open platform. So the VCs actually have offices there? Yeah, Ah. their entire firm is there. All right. In terms of a business, though, it's a real estate business. You're renting office space. 
you don't make money by making investments or... Yeah, um, so we don't think about it that way. Um, you could argue that a, um, a university is mostly made up of real estate, but that's not its purpose. You know, it makes its money by charging people to live there and go to classes, but it's in the same way, our mission is to make the world better through innovation. And the space that we curate is like a little city of innovation. Yes, people have to pay to you know, use space in that city. A lot of things we do are free and open to the public. A lot of things we do are nonprofit. Our wet laboratories and our robotics laboratories are actually nonprofits. Um, so we're a mission-driven business that happens to use real estate as a means of getting innovators together. Okay, let's dig down on that because there are, certainly over the last 10 years or so, there's been this explosion of co-working spaces and non-financial accelerators that are frankly often run by real estate companies. Mm -hmm. You've got over 500 companies in the space now. Over 1,400 companies in total now. Oh, really? Yeah. 1,400 companies yeah. in the space. That's Although amazing. in several different buildings. I guess what I'm saying, what are you doing different? What do the companies see in the Cambridge Innovation Center that they don't see in these dozens of other accelerators or yeah. innovation spaces? Um, so there's a lot of ways to answer that. First of all, there's a spectrum between uh, kind of mission-driven and sort of money-driven spaces. Uh, just as there, you know, there's a spectrum between, on the one end you've got something like a university, on the other end you've got something like a hotel, right? They're both, they both have space, they go to places people sleep, but they have different purposes for that. Even within the hotel business, you've got everything from sort of nonprofit youth hostels up to, you know, premium Four Seasons kind of experiences. This world is growing obviously quickly, and there are a lot of different models that people are presenting to the world. And just as in those other industries, you know, everything from community college to, you know, MIT, even in universities, there's a wide range, that that range will continue. I think where we sit is just our own little space. We're a, a warm, mission-driven community of serious entrepreneurs trying to change the world. We do it at a scale that nobody else does, so we're more city-like than sort of like a space. It's more like a, we call ourselves an, an innovation campus. When you visit one, you'll, you'll feel more like you're at a university and at the scale of that um, than uh, that you're in somebody's shared space. Just to contrast the the mission-driven approach to the, the real estate or landlord-driven mm -hmm. approach. Can you think of a time where, where you made a decision a certain way because you were mission-driven yeah, rather than? Well, so a good example is wet laboratories. The people in Boston were telling us, you guys really need to have the wet laboratory infrastructure that we need to build our companies. And we said, sure, and we did the math, and we found that it loses money. And that we could not make that math work for a number of reasons. And so wet labs are for life sciences? Yeah, or? wet labs are for what life sciences. It's, uh, where, you know, you have everything from, uh, you know, Petri dishes to um, you know, electron microscopes and DNA sequencing devices and things. And those things cost, you know, tens of millions of dollars. And uh, startups aren't necessarily able to really pay for them, although they need them. They just don't have the kind of capital that would support it. Uh, so we looked at that. We said, well, this is still needed. So, uh, so we went and we turned it into a nonprofit. Uh, we worked on this for years. We built it. It's very successful. Haven't made a dime on it. Mm. Do the nonprofits have corporate sponsors, or are they just structured as a nonprofit? No, for... typically governmental sponsors. Okay. And we also have corporate sponsors, but uh, for the most part, these sorts of initiatives are, are underwritten by the public sector as an economic development initiative. So we try to think, what do innovators need? What should the world look like? And then we figure out the way to make that happen, regardless of whether that makes us money or doesn't make us money. Okay. I've noticed that, that the community doesn't usually happen for co-working spaces. This is something that has interested me. When we were speaking earlier today, you mentioned the importance of proximity. Mm -hmm. What is it that you think is missing from most co-working spaces, or what do you think they could do better to increase collaboration or to build that community around them? Well, I'm sorry about the spaces you're referring to that don't have much community. I think good, good shared spaces always have community. So okay. it may be that those places just uh, need to make their mistakes and learn and sort of figure out how to build community. It certainly, it, it's taken us a long time to figure that out, and it's not easy. I, I think there are a number of factors that go into building any strong community. You need to have shared purpose. 
Uh, you need to have ground rules for behavior uh, and respect. You need to have leadership. So you can't just say, here you are. You know, somebody needs to say, hey, this is where we're going. You need to have access to the right kinds of ongoing uh, nurturing resources, whether it's more right people, more startups, more technologies, and so forth. You need to feed them. You need to feed them economically with investment and so forth so they grow. I mean, so I think you could take all of the things that you would think about to what makes a, you know, a healthy city and apply that to one of these and you'd find the same kinds of answers. So it sounds like it's very much not a passive endeavor. It's not a matter of just getting the right components in the same place. It, it's a lot of hands-on active management to create yeah. that. You know, a friend of mine is a city councilor in the city of Cambridge, and I think a lot of the things that he focuses on and that we focus on are very similar. Excellent. Let's talk about your plans for Japan and mm-hmm. CIC in Japan. It's actually astounding how far Japan has come in the last 15 years in terms of being startup friendly. So when I started my first company here, it was next to impossible to rent an office. Landlords would require 12 month security deposit, right. personal guarantees on, you know, leases. What year was that again? That was 1998. Okay, yeah, hangover from the good old days when they could get that stuff. Yeah, that's true. Real estate is not as full as it was in 1998 either. So people get a little more flexible. But it is actually pretty full. Um, Tokyo has about, is less than a 1% vacancy rate right now. So I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if landlords are kind of difficult. In general, in the United States, we have the same problems. You know, landlords are funded by banks. The banks want to see long leases with good credit companies like Microsoft sure, or something like sure. that. Well, I can't blame them for um, that. Yep. And the value of their building is actually usually determined by the perception of the longevity or the ability to pay of these tenants. So when you're a startup that comes along, you're kind of like a negative. You're going to reduce the value of their building by coming in. Uh, so I think there's, a, there's an inherent disconnect between the needs of startups and the needs of traditional real estate. So you're coming into Japan and you're planning on coming in on a pretty big scale. Yeah, I mean, what we're building now are, are innovation campuses, you know, very large spaces. The typical bases that we build will have, you know, thousands of entrepreneurs. In right. So in Japan, do you think there are enough entrepreneurs to fill that space? Or are you going to be partnering a lot with uh, larger companies to put in innovation centers within that space? How do you think it's going to play out here? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to both? <laughs> yes. Um, Tokyo is a city of 37 million people. It's got a lot of business activity, a lot of new business activity. Not all of it people might officially call a startup. Maybe those people don't even think that what they're doing is a startup, Mm -hmm. but they're building a new business. And there's a steady flow of those new businesses in Tokyo. It's so I think there's a sort of a misperception if it's not like, you know, listed in TechCrunch and backed by a venture capitalist and have somebody who used to work in California involved, then it's not a startup. It's not a real startup. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's, I think, sort of a sort of a more of an image thing. This city has a, is a very vibrant economic city with very high level of competition and constant invention of new ideas and new businesses. So you're going to be looking at, at sort of mid-sized firms as well? It's not necessarily just a startup focused? Well, so, no, I, I mean startups. I just mean that if you look across, you, you may see a company which is rolling out a new chain of restaurants. That you may see a company that has a more efficient way to have dishes washed in restaurants. You, know, you may not see these coming across on the radar as startups, but they are new businesses and they're applying new approaches. And they're all over. I meet them all the time in Tokyo. I think people have an image. It's like, oh, are you doing an app that you know, sells pizza online? Or, you know, like they, there's a sort of an image of what a startup is. There's just a much broader array of business. Okay, so I guess it really is more innovation-driven businesses. Exactly. Regardless of age or size. Um, well, I guess sizes. Yeah, I mean, t- typically they're, they're on the newer side. We do tend to take companies that are a bit... We, we have a higher maximum size. We've had a number of companies that have reached 200 people. But... For the most part, they've started it as one or two people. We don't generally have people come in as a large business. Right. Uh, they may stay and grow with us until they're much larger. Let me put it this way. I mean, if you plopped New York down in the, in the middle of Tokyo, it would take up a small part of Tokyo. Mm-hmm. The absolute volume of activity here is enormous. If you compare just the number of shared spaces in Tokyo, one company alone, Regis, probably has six or seven times more space than they have in San Francisco. And those are all small operations, um, not you know, huge companies, not mid-sized companies. 
And most of them are new or small businesses that people are trying to build into a larger business. What you're trying to do is you're trying to create an environment when people, where people are building those businesses, have better access to new technology, have better access to information about growing it, have better access to global markets for what they're growing, largely through the connections that they can make in an actual community. Are you going to be opening it up to foreign technology companies that are entering the Japanese market, or are you going to try to focus on the Japanese ecosystem? Well, uh, we already know that a number of the startups that we work with overseas have said, you know, when you go to a country, let us know, because it would be easier for us to come in with you. All right. The kinds of companies that have grown up uh, at CSE in Cambridge, you know, it's easier for them to come with us. Okay. So, yes, I think that will be another element. All right. You grew Cambridge Innovation Center for 15 years in pretty much one spot. And recently you've been expanding. Tokyo won't be your first international expansion. No, the Netherlands were, was first. Right. And you've had a couple of other innovation centers in uh, St. Louis and a, kind of a satellite in Boston. Uh, yeah, although the satellite's getting almost as big as the, <laughs> the mothership. They'll probably get bigger. And Miami, we just opened last month. All right. So this is a very different approach than, say, um, WeWork, which is opening tiny little offices uh, around the world. Have you noticed that the community builds up differently or the dynamics have been different at different locations than they were in Cambridge? We've been really surprised that they've not been different. Really? Yeah, that we go into the Netherlands and we find our people. They're the same people that we know. I mean, the same types of people, the same outlooks and same aspirations and global backgrounds, speak lots of languages, not necessarily Dutch, um, that we find in Boston or in St. Louis. And you go to a St. Louis, which is not a famous innovation city or hadn't been, and you see really interesting com companies raising tens of millions of dollars of venture capital and growing and having sales outposts on the coasts and in other countries. And Again, there's a kind of a narrow thinking that sort of innovation is somehow you know, owned by a couple of spots. There's a very big focus on the kind of the big coastal innovation cities. But if you look back in history, I mean, let's take St. Louis, for example. Uh, there was a great Super Bowl ad by the Anheuser-Busch founder. You know, that was an immigrant who got in a boat and on a train and started brewing beer in St. Louis and built one of the world's biggest companies. But, and there's a whole lot of those in a place like St. Louis. Well, I agree, actually. And it one of my goals with starting Disrupting Japan was kind of showing the world that there's tremendous innovation going on here in Tokyo. It, it isn't just San Francisco. It absolutely isn't. But what made you pick these particular cities? Well, each, Rotterdam, city, each city has Tokyo. a story. Yeah. Uh, in the long run, I think that there are probably 50-ish cities around the world that have the research and development chops mm -hmm. to be a major innovation city. You know, cities like Paris and Beijing, you know, really have just terrific R&D. I mean, Tokyo, of course. Um, and so they'll all eventually have something like us, I imagine, if not us. So in one sense, we're kind of comfortable going to these cities in what, whatever order is most convenient. We don't, we don't have to pick a particular order to get to serve all of them. Okay. Um, but there are particular stories. So with St. Louis... Uh, Washington University of St. Louis is one of the leading medical schools in the country. It's very well resourced compared to many. Uh, St. Louis is the second richest city in the United States in terms of unearned income. Really? Uh, yep. St. Louis. St. I would Louis. not have guessed. No, you would have not have guessed. But what that means is a lot of rich people, old money in St. Louis. And that translates well to innovation, angel investment and venture mm -hmm. investment. You have to activate it. You have to explain what you're doing and get those folks to find a path to be involved. Okay. So CIC can be that catalyst, that trigger that connects the university research. We are. The entrepreneurship going on we there and the are. money that's coming in from the... In my talk this morning, we I mentioned we, we see sort of three key resources that entrepreneurs need, money, ideas, and talent. And so if we can create an environment where there's good access to money, ideas, and talent, uh, then you're going to create a lot of innovation. Okay. Now, it's, it's still early days. These newer offices were only opened recently, but do you see interaction between the offices other than kind of a market entry approach? Oh, yeah, uh, quite a bit. So first of all, your access card works everywhere and you have the right to work everywhere. So you're part of a family. Uh, you can show up in any city where we're in and just walk in. We actually have um, some relationships with other places around the world. So I think there are 50, 60 places around the world where you can go and work if you're, a, if you're part of the CIC network. We see many companies that actually have employees in multiple cities. 
okay. uh, that we're at. And they, they have one contract and they just saw it very simple, but they can say, oh, this person's here, this person's there. Increasingly, uh, the structure of companies is changing mm -hmm. in the way that companies are liking to be more flexible about where their employees are. We have venture capitalists who travel from one to another to go look for interesting deals to invest in. Our, our staff move around quite a bit. If you're you know, an American working in Boston, you want to have a few months in Europe, and that's kind of fun. You can just move and go work in Europe. And so you're bringing with you your network and your connections. So the companies you're meeting, you're saying, oh, gee, you guys should be working with these people over in the other location. Well, and I think that is incredibly attractive to growing startups, particularly in Japan where there's just been this overriding theme of, of going global and the importance of not relying on the domestic economy here. Yep. to fuel growth. Do you expect things to work out pretty much the same way in the Japan location than you do in others? Or well, are you... I think we're both, we've both spent a lot of time in Japan, yeah. and nothing works out in Japan quite the way it works <laughs> out everywhere else. I think that, that was a trick question. But um, at the same time, you don't really know how they're going to work out until you try them. So this is the entrepreneur in me uh, that says, well, you've got to just go do it. I think that's a, a healthy attitude of you know it's going to be different, you're just not quite sure how different. Exactly. Yeah. So you adapt, you, you come up with new mechanisms. I, I think we'll be developing with others new mechanisms to help large Japanese corporations get involved in innovation. And I don't mean teaching them how to do it. I mean actually encouraging them to try specific models that may work for them to get new projects off the ground. Now, this is interesting because I think, and let's, let's talk about Japan for a bit. Because I think right now, Japanese enterprise is trying to find a model of innovation that works for them. Yes. There's fantastic fundamental research being done in Japan. Yep. But a lot of large enterprises seem to have forgotten how to productize. Yep. From what you've seen in the conversations you've had, what do you think look like the most promising approaches? My sense is that, in general, both Japanese and American large companies are not so good at productizing genuinely new ideas. It's no accident that you know, our leading electric car company in the United States is a startup and not one of the big three. So first of all, we shouldn't understand this as a Japanese problem, but as an innovation problem. We can look to great authors like Clayton Christensen to explain why this is in his book, The Innovator's Dilemma. He outlines this, and we all kind of understand it. Many of the more forward-thinking companies in the United States have essentially said, you know what, we're not going to try to do serious innovation in-house. In, in uh, we're going to do a couple of things. We're going to go out and invest in and partner with and buy startups when they've got something interesting that affects our business. Not necessarily pull them too closely in, but let them be a little bit independent, give them some resources, maybe give them access to our larger resources, but let them grow. And where there's an idea that a company wants to pursue and there's no real startup out there doing it, okay, so spin something out. Take some people, put them off on their own, away from the mothership, give them a little money, tell them that they're going to lose their jobs if they're not successful. But have you seen this successfully executed in Japan yet, or companies making serious efforts to try this? Because I know, for example, strategic M&A is still very, very rare here. Yeah, no, I think that's true. Uh, what's more common in Japan is that the startups themselves simply become successful and will, like Tesla, kind of replace the old guard rather than be, become part of the old guard. I think that's, that's true in the United States and Japan. So then the question is, you know, can Japan get a little better at this? Can a Japanese hotel chain, you know, kind of buy a startup hotel operator and have it as a second line? Absolutely, they can. Do they need to get better at that? Yeah, they probably do. The small sustaining innovations, they seem to do very well. Mm -hmm. The big breakthroughs is what they seem to be struggling with yeah. these days. No, I think that's true. Um, I mean, I think fundamentally there's not quite enough mobility in the Japanese work flow system. People, once they get their job, they're going to hopefully keep that job for a long time. We know this. And that makes them pretty risk averse. They don't want to lose that job. If they make no big mistakes, they get to keep it for life. And so why take risk? Um, so so I, I am actually starting to think that uh, Japanese companies, that there are some new models that might work for Japanese companies. That in a in sense that they might call a halt to the current employment system, say, okay, everybody who's got it, you keep it. But from now on, we're going to try some different things. You know, I think that sort of happened silently over the last 15 years. And I think this is one of the reasons we're seeing this boom in, in startups in Japan, is that the lifetime employment system never officially ended, right. but nobody expects it anymore unless you go into government. 
And I think that's true, but you're still becoming a shine of Mitsubishi Shoji. You may not actually expect to have a lifetime employment, but many of the sort of trappings are the same and the hopes uh, are the same. Yeah, there's still yeah. tremendous social status in having that, right. and that so kind the, of a name. So the, so the strongest folks sort of aim for that kind of status. It leads to reproductive success and other drivers that, that are important to people. The question will be, can some Japanese companies start to forge a, a new kind of social contract with employees? I am hearing that, that some of the brightest kids coming out of schools are interested in something more creative. They're, they're a little worried about being stuck in the big corporation for life, um, whereas I think maybe a generation ago they weren't too worried about that. That was kind of expected. I'm hoping to work with partners here to say, hey, what if we were to kind of a new kind of kogaisha, a new kind of subsidiary. It uses the company's name, but it looks and works more like a startup, and the deal really is with that and not with the honsha. I think that there's a pony in here where companies can start building interesting businesses that are sort of somewhere between a startup and part of a large company. I, I see what you mean. So something where they're not putting their brand at risk and they can keep the they keep may, the They may the use a sub-brand or something. Arm's length. I think there will be a degree to which they do need to put their brand at risk, but I think that they can make clear that this is in the category of a new experimental business. And actually, you've lived in Japan. You've got some roots here. What were you doing in Japan? Yeah, Talk sure. About that um, so I, after college, I got a job at Mitsubishi Research. Institute, MRI, or Mitsubishi Sogo Kenkyujo in Japanese, and spent four years, loved it, doing long-term technology forecasting, looking at trends in you know, mobile phones and pollution control equipment and things like that. You know, single, just out of college, right. living in a uh, Nagaya on Tsukishima. Oh, okay. Um, it's a, sort of an old, long row house, you know, with the traditional tatami mat floors and sliding paper walls. And so you've done the salaryman thing. I, I have, sort of. I had a motorcycle. You know, would travel around Japan and Japan is a uh, wonderful country for motorcycles. It Lots is. of winding roads and beautiful canyons. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of a paradise uh, in many ways, and and the work was fantastic too. Uh, There's great colleagues and thoughtful, and this is my first sort of real job. I'd had a sort of software startup starting in middle school, right. um, but I was always I was always the boss, <laughs> and so this was, it was. Boy, that's a change. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, uh, why'd you leave? Um, what made you go back to the States? It's a great question, actually. I decided that I was never going to be uh, the CEO of Mitsubishi Research Institute. Uh, so there was sort of a glass ceiling issue for me in that company. That's actually kind of probably wrong uh, in the sense that there now uh, have been uh, non-Japanese CEOs of a bunch of big Japanese organizations. When was that? When were you here? Uh, I was here in 90 to 94. Oh, boy, that was a different world, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It was a terrific <laughs> world. But it was also, and as I said, I think I may have been wrong, but I, at the time I thought it was clear that I was always going to be kind of a little bit of the outsider. And I felt like I wanted to, to build something, also maybe something a little more global. And so I went to business school at MIT. That was the specific draw to, you know, the reason to go back. And then I joined Boston Consulting Group, and I was there for another four years. And so it was actually kind of similar work, but it was more global mm -hmm. and an international firm. In other words, there were people from all nationalities at the firm instead of just Japanese. It sounds like you were on a very good career track here. What made you leave Boston Consulting and start a startup incubator slash um, that was innovation more, center? I think. Two things. What my wife and I uh, were thinking it was time to have kids. And she was at McKinsey & Company and doing a similar lifestyle, similarly all, all around the world. And we knew that the, it wasn't going to be possible for us to actually have anything like a family life with those jobs. Right. Um, so we wanted to quit our jobs. And then the question was, well, what do we do? And I had been an entrepreneur. And I said, well, let's just start companies. You know, it'll be great. <laughs> there are lots of free time when you do that. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, the, what there is is there is more control over your life. You can decide... Yeah. For yourself, you know, where you're going to be. Are you, are you going to be in Singapore for six months or, or not? You can decide. You still end up working a lot of hours. You just have control over which ones. Yeah, I think that's a nice way to put it. All right. Getting back to Japan, one of the big drivers of innovation in Boston is clearly the universities. As we mentioned before, there's great fundamental research being done at the universities in Japan. What advice do you have for universities on how they can help foster entrepreneurship? What, what type of programs should they be running in Japan? This is a complicated question, but I think the first thing is that the, the universities themselves need to drink more of the MIT Kool-Aid and focus more on usable invention. You know, the MIT 
motto, mens et manus, you know, it's, it's the mind, thinking about things in the hand, actually figuring out how to do them is what's important. And there's a little bit too much mens and not enough manus uh, at the Japanese universities. I mean, there are a lot of Japanese who have studied at MIT. Famously, Nobel Prize winner Tony Gawasensei is, is at MIT. So they've got people they can turn to to say, help us understand this. You know, help us spread this. You know, Joey Ito, who's bicultural, runs the Media Lab at MIT. There are a number of folks that really get it yeah. that can help Japan understand it. Uh, so internalize this sort of more practical, you know, let's actually do something that's useful to the world kind of approach into the university. So it would be one. On a practical level, is that culture fostered by, for example, having professors more actively involved in not necessarily just startups, but involved in businesses and involved in the practical aspects of running a company? Where does that come from? Even in the United States, there are many famous universities that don't encourage that. Um, I don't think that this is a cultural thing. This is about practices and about leadership. It's about saying what's okay and what you're encouraged to do. And, and many European universities are on the Japanese model. So, you know, same culture, different system, mm-hmm. right? So I think that uh, it's pretty straightforward. I think that, uh, yes, professors need to get involved in startups. Yes, universities need to prioritize in their advancement and the recognition of academics, their role in more practical applications than just the basic research and the thinking. That's a problem that we have in the United States as well in many universities, so this is not one place that needs to work on that. There's a lot of countries that need to work on that. But, but if you ask me what you know, Japan needs to do, I think this is a priority. I think Japan is actually very good at practical innovation. I think the universities just need to move a little bit more in that direction. And actually the corporations need to move in the other direction. They're very practical, they're very product focused, and they need to come back to a little bit more fundamental revolutionary technology. Okay to start paying attention to something that, that is a significant disruptive leap. Yeah, exactly. I, I think to some, sometimes because of this well-understood innovator's dilemma that large corporations and sometimes just don't have an incentive to develop something that will kill their own successful sure, products, sure. Um, because of that, you kind of need to red team a little bit. If you're the blue team and you're making you know, gasoline cars, you may need to create a little separate business, which is the red team, which is making electric cars, and not have it sort of sit under the gasoline car division or else you'll never really put your heart into it. And, and for the listeners who don't know, the, the red team is the team you assemble to attack what you have. What you already have, yeah. right, and to try to change things. Right. And if you don't assemble your own red team, then your somebody else is going to be your red team, yeah. and then, then you lose. All right. Now, before, we were talking about proximity, One of the things I've noticed at many Japanese universities is that the engineering students, the business students, the design students are often not only in separate classrooms or buildings, but separate campuses entirely. Have you noticed at, for example, at MIT or at the CIC in particular, are there active programs to encourage the mixing of different disciplines? Yeah, uh, there are. Um, so first of all, both MIT and Harvard essentially have one campus. The, the medical school at Harvard is, is physically separate due to space limitations. The, so I think that they have the advantage of, of that kind of proximity. But then even you know, 20 years ago, we had a program called TechLink at MIT where people from each of the departments would get together and sort of present to the students, and by people I mean students, from the other departments what they're working on. Uh, we had a great class at MIT Sloan School that I took Uh, Steve Eppinger's class um, on new product development, where a third of the class was MIT Sloan Business School students, a third were engineering students that were building, you know, mechanical things, Uh, and a third were Rhode Island School of Design students, an entirely separate university. They built teams with at least one student from each of these schools, and we built real product. There was a sort of a voting process where we chose what products to build, and then each team went and and built a a real product from beginning to end, uh, leveraging all of those skills. All right. So do you have plans for doing this type of program and working with university professors at CIC Tokyo? Yeah, so actually we are working already with university professors. Professor uh, Kagami uh, Shigeo at University of Tokyo has signed on as the chair of our sort of social intervention nonprofit, Venture Cafe it's called, that we will also build in Tokyo. This is exactly the kind of thing that we're hoping to do. Okay, fantastic. Well, listen, before I let you go, is there anything that you want to talk about or anything that I really should have asked you but just simply forgot? Well, I think one thing I would just say is, coming back to the topic of culture, I think there's a mistaken impression in Japan that, you know, Japan's not good at startups or Japan's not innovative enough. 
it's important to recognize that you know Japan may be Japan is something like a little over one percent of the world's population, but has eleven percent of the world's biggest, most successful companies. Mm. Japan is way outperforming. It is an unbelievable performer, and all of those companies were startups at one point. People forget how incredibly innovative Sony and Seiko yeah, and exactly. Toyota were. Right. So. To say that Japan has a cultural problem would miss the fact that Japan had the same culture when it built those businesses. When you observe that, then you realize that this isn't really a cultural problem. It's more of a structural problem, hmm. um, something that you can change. Whereas culture is usually, you imagine, is sort of tough to change. You know, structure is actually changeable. It's just a matter of changing the processes. Yeah, change the processes, change the laws, change the rules, change the incentives, and then things will change. So I guess I would just close on that to say, you know, this is all you know, really BS about Japan not being able to build new businesses that become world-leaning you know, businesses, triple unicorns. Japan's good at that. Yeah. We just need to work with Japan, I think, a little bit to identify those aspects of its current structure that are getting in the way. Okay. Well, it's going to be really interesting to watch CIC doing that here in Tokyo. That's why we're coming. All right. Well, listen, Tim, thanks so much for sitting down with me. All right. Thank you. Kotowork is doing something pretty cool. It's a community of Japanese language students who want to work at Japanese companies with global ambitions. Kotowork also trains them in business culture, Japanese hospitality, and a bit of global marketing. And since it's a real community, Kotowork is always there for both candidates and companies to solve cultural misunderstandings and the hundreds of other little problems that can come up when foreigners work for a Japanese company. Kotowork has a wonderful, long-term, community-based approach to making sure everything runs smoothly, and you should really check them out at kotowork, with a C, dot JP. And we're back. It's pretty clear that there's no simple formula for creating an innovation space, at least one that truly acts as a catalyst for innovation and the birthplace of new technologies and disruptive companies. Perhaps one of the reasons that the CIC did so many things right, and this is easy to forget because they're such a huge organization today, was that the entire project was a bottom-up affair. CIC was formed and grew initially, not with the vision to place itself at the center of innovation, but by simply trying to meet the immediate needs of their startup tenants. The CIC itself is an entrepreneurial initiative. Many of the innovation spaces in Japan, however, are top-down. They are either organized by local governments or real estate companies, and often as a combination of the two. Of course, it's not as simple as bottom-up versus top-down. I found the success of CIC's expansion facilities particularly interesting, and frankly, very encouraging. You see, their new centers in St. Louis and Rotterdam were top-down affairs. They weren't grown organically from the ground up, but modeled after and informed by what they learned from Cambridge. And yet, as Tim explained, the dynamics of the ecosystem has been very much the same at the new facilities as at the original. So it seems that there is a blueprint for top-down success. It'll be interesting to see if they can achieve that same level of success with their Tokyo facility. Of course, one of the things that Tim and I both agree on is that nothing ever works out quite the way you expect it to in Japan. And yet the timing is right, and there is a great group of people and companies behind this project. So even though things never go as planned in Japan, I think we can expect to see great things from CIC in Japan in the next few years. If you've ever worked at an innovation center or are thinking of doing so, Tim and I would love to hear from you. So come by disruptingjapan.com slash show 076 and let us know what you think. And when you come by, you'll see all the links and resources that Tim and I talked about and much, much more in the resources section of the post. And hey, I know you've been meaning to do this for a while now, but when you get the chance, please leave us an honest review on iTunes. It's really the best way you can help us get the word out and support the show. But most of all, thanks for listening. And thank you for letting people interested in Japanese startups know about the show. I'm Tim Romero, and thanks for listening to Disrupting Japan.